The 1975 Stephen King book, Salem's Lot, is a brand new film. And it's exclusively on one of those stupid streaming services. This time, Max. And look, it makes perfect financial sense. You look at it and what it did box office number-wise, which was very impressive, and it was well-received by audiences. Obviously, Stephen King and company are going to take another beloved book, and they're going to try to do it all over again. Was that a Pennywise decision, though? Let's find out together. Come on, jo join me. It's just over here. I'm going back and forth on whether or not I spoil anything in this movie. I suppose I won't. Um, it's not good. All right, let's just get the cards on the table right away. It's not good. If you wouldn't mind subscribing to the channel before I go on a little, you know, pissy bitch fest about this film, please do. It costs you nothing. It's free of... Yep, uh, I'm told it's free of charge still to just hit the subscribe button. I would appreciate it. Even liking and hitting the notification bell will help out the channel, and I would appreciate it. Much like with It, Salem's Lot was also a miniseries on TV in 1979. The book came out in 1975. A couple years went by. They went for it. And here they are again. Just a few more years have come and gone since. But it is with a heavy shart that I tell you, Salem's Lot did not achieve what It did. First of all, it didn't even go to theaters. Where, where's it at? They, they put in theaters. It's coming right to Max, which is kind of a death sentence to begin with. It just screams to audiences, hey, this isn't that good. What we have here, folks, is an R-rated hour and 54 minute chore to get through. And the funny part is it's not boring. It's not slow. Uh, a lot of stuff happens. Too much stuff happens in such a small window of time. It would make you think maybe this material would have been better off getting split into a two-parter like it did. There just seems to be way too much going on and nothing's really adding up. The plot of this film is very unconventional for Stephen King. It's about an author moving back to a small town to find inspiration. To find himself, really, at the end of the day. King really likes the whole small town thing, having an author be the protagonist. You write about things you know. It makes sense. So he heads back to Jerusalem's lot where he's going to get in touch with his roots again. He's going to befriend a young woman named Susan Norton who he sees reading one of his books. She tells him she might not finish the thing, so obviously not his number one fan, but she will grow to like him over the course of however many days this is. I'm not sure. It felt like a week, but the way they act towards each other by the time this thing winds down would make you think they're inseparable star-crossed lovers that have known each other for many, many moons. But uh, no, I don't think that's it. I don't think that's what happened. Again, hard to know because things happen so quickly and so frantically, you really don't have time to connect with anyone. Much like It, we do have a young group of kids we're going to follow, another loser squad. One of them's getting bullied. But unlike with those guys, Mark Petrie, the new kid in town, is going to stand up for himself. He's not taking crap from no one. Petrie here, played by Jordan Preston Carter, is the best character in the movie. And they take this character to a ridiculous level. It's one thing to stand up to your bullies. It's another to go rogue throughout the town, taking out vampires left and right, which is what this kid starts doing. It's, it's absolutely absurd. There's just not enough time spent with this character. Maybe had the movie made this a focus and got rid of the author angle altogether, which really doesn't add up to much of anything anyways, might have had a better film. Or you make this a miniseries. Well, they did. Maybe we shouldn't have touched it again. Shenanigans are revealed pretty early on when kids start going missing and showing back up again with fang marks and a thirst for blood. And this vampire that's living in the most obvious place ever up on a hill house wastes very little time making short work of this town. And before you know it, Salem's Lot has a lot of vampires. There was a miniseries on Netflix called Midnight Mass that came out a couple years ago. I thought that was very well done. Could have probably whittled down a little bit of the material, but overall, I thought that was incredibly well done, visually stunning, great performances, very creepy vibe. None of that's present in this movie. In fact, the lighting is bizarre. It's kind of like a YouTuber like this right now where there's just random neon lights and stuff hitting people. There's greens and reds. And I kept thinking, where the fuck is the light source coming from that there's this giant green wall hitting this person? I believe this is a first time director, so he's still getting his feet wet with all of it, but there's no excuse for the day to night filter that they're still using. It's so bad. One of the first scenes in the film features two guys taking a casket down into the cellar. The cellar should be pitch black, but I see everything Billy Crystal clear down there. 
because we're using this shitty blue filter. So it's really hard to get in the headspace of a guy that bumps into something and says, I can't see shit down here when I see everything. And they're just burning through this story at rapid fire pace. If you're looking for some scares, some action, some thrills, I, I really did not find any of that. There was one scene where one of the kids is kidnapped and he's in a bag and he's kind of looking through some of the mesh in the bag and there's getting glimpses of the vampire walking down the stairs. And I thought, okay, this is cool. This is a great concept. I like the whole bag vision, first person thing we're doing, but it's over before you know it. And it did not lead to a scare as I was hoping it would. It's just a small little atmospheric touch in an otherwise lifeless film. The score is generic, the people are unremarkable or unmemorable, the, the lead guy is just kind of like sleeping through the role. Really, again, the kid, Mark, is the only one that's kind of got some energy to him. The main vampire poses very little threat outside of, again, that opening sequence where it's showcasing, yeah, no one's safe here, kind of like with It taking out a kid early on, it sets the stakes. That sets the stakes. Subscribe for accidental puns. But outside of that, nothing here. It's absolutely not worth watching. Such a waste of my time. And sadly, I would easily rewatch this again over the pile of ass I watched afterwards. Apartment 7A. Holy crap, that was awful. And I'll be talking about that movie on my next review, so maybe think about sticking around for it. All right, let me know your thoughts. Were you a big fan of the book, Salem's Lot? So you were hoping they would really capture that magic and energy all over again. Can't imagine you're thrilled with this one. Let me know in the comments below. Please like, subscribe, notification bell, all that stuff. And then I'll see you next time. If you love what I'm doing, highly encourage you becoming a member on Patreon at patreon.com slash adamdoesmovies. I redid the tier levels. At just $5 a month, you get access to an exclusive show called The Cringe, where I'm playing this ridiculous character, Khaleesi Grimes 82. It's really fun. And obviously, if you support it even higher tiers, you get access to vlogs, reviews. There's a ton of stuff there. I would really appreciate the support. And hopefully, I'll catch you next time.